being the only one in my life that believed in my own power and in the low moments worrying that they were all actually right about me and I was clinging to a delusion. Okay, there's still a hierarchy of emotions in there that comes from Mormonism. If you're looking at somebody who is angry and you're saying to them that they need to leave it alone, then you don't understand the role of anger in someone's healing. That to me is somebody who has bypassed their own anger and is telling other people to do the same. And that is something that needs to be deconstructed. Like I've just had way too many unanswered prayers in that way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I view that as God rather than like, okay, let me pray to this thing and ask for help with something because I'm like, I just don't think it works like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Welcome to the Nuance Ho YouTube channel and the Mormon History Hoedown. I am Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuance Ho. I am here in my new home studio where I get to do lots of fun in-person interviews where I'm going to be taking on guests like um, therapists and Mormon historians. I'm also going to be inviting on a lot of really dazzling people with interesting stories. So my guest today is Stephanie Brinkerhoff. So you might know Stephanie from her Mormon Stories interview. You've talked about your journey from being a faithful Mormon mom and then trying psychedelics. How would you describe yourself when you first tried psychedelics? What, like over 100% in believing in the church? Yeah. Yeah. And a last ditch effort to try to get out of some anxiety and depression. Yeah. So instead of rehashing all of Stephanie's story, she has some great interviews that you can go check out and I can leave some links below, but I wanted to invite you on today to talk about not just the old ex-Mormon thing with psychedelics. You know, I saw a joke where, hey, ex-Mormons, you know, you don't have to do psychedelics and you don't have to do them. And I'm not a drug pusher or anything, but <laughs> we are going to talk about the difference that they make and some transformative experiences that you had as a person in the Mormon church and then what the journey was leading you out. And then I want to talk about one of the most important topics to me, which is kind of like regaining your autonomy, your power, your intuition, and all of the times in our life when we're Mormon and female. And this, this could be true of anyone, religious or not, just when you are not in spaces where fulfilling your mission, your role, your autonomy of knowing who you are. It's just not welcomed. And I was telling Stephanie before we started, it's one of my my deepest, most sincere wishes that we didn't just have like what bleeds leads on in different ex Mormon spaces. We're talking about like all the reasons the church isn't true and all of that stuff and just nut punches to Joseph Smith and stuff. I'm like after that, and we know that, you know, this system isn't working for us. I try to give the listeners just some validation, some insights, and then possibly if they feel like it, if they ever want to dabble in the psychedelic realm, you do you guys. Let's start off at the beginning. So tell me about you. Where did you grow up? What type of Mormonism were you raised in? What were your like psychological anchors and what worked for you within Mormonism? And then tell me about what didn't work for you within Mormonism. Yeah, so I grew up in Layton, so in Davis County. Grew up in a very Mormon family. Um, like, didn't watch TV on Sundays, didn't drink caffeine, you know, like the the stereotypical Molly Mormon. I was called Molly Mormon a lot. I feel like most of Mormonism worked for me when I was in it. I didn't really have issues with it when I was in it. I didn't realize I had problems until after I left or when I was leaving. Um, it worked for me because as like a naturally more anxious person, it felt like a safe space and it was kind of like, okay, if I can just check off these uh, things on this list, then I know that I'm safe, you know, and, you know, you're surrounded by community, you're surrounded by people who think the same way as you, but at least it worked for my um, persona. It worked for my ego, like who I thought I was. It worked very well. It's like comfortable. It was comfortable for me there. It was like, like checking the boxes. Yeah. And then like once I started to deconstruct and left the church and all that, that's when I realized like, oh, this is actually very harmful because everything that was working for me in the church, um, I was associating that with the church, but it wasn't actually the church, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It was like they were just taking monopoly on that. And so then I kind of had to untangle like what is actually mine, what is coming from me, what is just um, inherent in me from being like a human being versus 
um, what was coming from the church, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then I realized the only things that were coming from the church were like the bad stuff, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> what were some of the, um, do you have any like stories or examples of kind of feeling that dissonance between the ways that you were fulfilling your covenants within Mormonism and then not actually feeling at home in your, yourself. And yeah, it was interesting because I never attributed it to the church. I never, I never thought it was because of what Mormonism was teaching. I always thought it was just mental health. I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling well because I'm not mentally well, you know, because that's like what the church will tell you. It's like, you either have to pray and, you know, be more faithful or whatever, or you got to go and get like on a medication because you have like a, a chemical imbalance or whatever, you mm -hmm. know? And so um, I never attributed it to the church. I just thought like, oh, I have mental health issues and that's why I'm struggling. So I was always seeking for this state of like inner peace is really all I would say that it is. It's not like I was trying to have some sort of like enlightened experience or anything crazy. I just didn't want to feel like shitty, you know? And that's when like all of my endeavors to feel better were purely in the name of mental health. Like I wasn't like, I feel like there's more for my soul. It was like, I was so fulfilled in Mormonism. <laughs> I sound so basic, but I was so fulfilled. I was just like, okay, I just got to get my mental health under control. What were like the steps in which you finally were like the, you know, SSRIs or exercising or all of that mental health things that you were willing to kind of go and break with the Mormon tradition of yeah. going into something that seems so scary to so many people like drugs, yeah, drugs, illegal so, drugs. Yeah. So take me through a little bit of your journey of yeah, what led you to finally saying that psychedelics must be the thing that I try next. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it took a while. It took like maybe a solid year. I was like listening to all these podcasts about it and watching documentaries and, you know, reading about the study, the scientific studies. And then, and then also I was, I was learning about like the spiritual, like indigenous history of it. And I was like, that made me feel like better about it. I was like, oh, like it's not the same as like doing meth it's it's just like a plant from the earth and you know they only banned it because the war on drugs because nobody wanted to fight in their wars anymore you know mm -hmm. i was like totally going down that like rabbit hole fantastic and, fungi yeah, yeah yeah all that all that stuff and i had been on an ssri for maybe seven years mm. and i was like is this this is it like this is this is what we got this is my life for the rest of my life you know it was like okay this is this is really unfortunate. So I'm going to, yeah, kind of give it like a one last hurrah. You know, I'm like, I was willing to try anything basically. So I found a drug dealer and I did drugs. And she shot them into her veins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. tell me about where you kind of started mentally and then through the course of different psychedelic treatments, yeah. you could say like, what were your trips like? What did you realize? Were your fears quelled? Where the, your, was your mind expanded? Take me on the journey. Yeah. I mean, the first uh, trip, I didn't really have the only fear I had going into it was like kind of like the unknown. And also like, hopefully I'm not sinning, you know, <laughs> just like af afraid of that. Yeah. Because what did you say right before we started? Yeah, like, I was like praying on the way. There. The last like thought she had as a Mormon was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, please forgive me if I'm doing something wrong, you know. But I didn't know, like, if I had never done them. And at that point, like, I, the only things I had heard about them were good. And so I wasn't really that scared other than that. I was kind of appreh apprehensive, but I wasn't, like, you know, freaking out or anything. Um, and then it was, like, very shortly after that. I mean, the trip itself was fine. I only did, like, a gram. It wasn't even crazy. And then it was in, like, the coming weeks after that that I was, like, okay, something's not sitting right with this Mormon church that I've been doing for my whole life, you know. I didn't have like any sort of like transcendent experience. It was just like my brain was kind of like, wait a minute, you know, like I feel like they're taking something from me that's not actually theirs. And I was like paying attention to the things that they were saying and I could see how much right, at church. Yeah. Like at church or I remember listening to general conference and being like, what is he saying? President Nelson, he was talking about how families can be together forever, but it was like this beautiful thing. Like families are together forever. And then it was like, but mm -hmm simply wishing to be with your family forever isn't going to be enough. Like essentially like you got to go to the temple, you know? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know if that really makes sense to me anymore. Like, I just feel like I'm going to be with my family no matter what 
forever, you know, however that works. You know what I mean? Even if there, if that even happens after in the afterlife. From there, I experimented a lot with different psychedelics. I mean, I I left the church pretty quickly and then I was very much on the the train. I, I jumped on the bandwagon, psychedelic bandwagon, like everybody does. And I have um for good reason sometimes. Yeah, I have very strong opinions about psychedelics because my experience has been so um difficult. But I would say, yeah, like they're what got me out of the church. Like had I not done them, I never would have, I don't think I ever would have left. So would you mind going back into, I love what you said about, you know, the church taking something, a type of autonomy stolen and a type of intuition Mm -hmm. that was taken and, you know, sold back to us Yeah, that they didn't. That's what always I feel like is such a universal language between people who are like victims of just whether cults or different types of abusive relationships or any space where you're not able to yeah, live authentically. Did you have a moment when you realized that the church, yeah, you can, you can be happy there. You can find community there, but essentially you're in a space where they're taking something from you. Do you have moments that you like remember specifically where you're like, you know, standing in your new Stephanie power and not letting the church kind of take that from you anymore? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a lot of mini moments over the course of maybe like three or four months. Everything that they were claiming to give, give people had like a condition or a stipulation. And it was like, but there doesn't need to be any sort of condition or stipulation for whatever it is that they're supposedly offering people. So it's like, who made the condition in the first place? Like even just the, even just the like, you know, you have to, you, you have to be married in the temple to be with your family. It's like, had the church never come along, that idea wouldn't have even existed. It's like, they give us the problem and then they supply us the solution. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I started to recognize those patterns. So it felt like all of these things that just like, whether it's my intuition, my own connection to, you know, oneness or God or whatever you want to call it. Um, even having a sense of community, I was like, wait a minute, if the church didn't exist, then we would just be a like a world community <laughs> here in Utah. It would just be like the church is the one that they're like, this is a this is a great community. But really, I'm like, you're the ones that drew the line in the sand. And we're kind of like, OK, you have to be in here in order to be a part of it. You yeah. know what I mean? And especially the first time that I did psychedelics, the first thing I felt I had been out of the church for, I don't know, two or three years. And the first thing I felt was a, a type of like spiritual religiosity in a way that I hadn't felt since I was at church when you are having like an elevated emotion, when you're, you know, singing a hymn and you just feel like really connected to all the people like at girls camp or whatever. I was like, I just, we're all just of one, one species, like one consciousness. Like, and then I was like, ah, this compared the, the feeling of like, man, we're all, I have so much love for everybody. I have so much love for myself. And then I remember like trying to put my mind into my Mormon mind and being like, so separated, so delineated between like hierarchies Mm -hmm. and like men and women and status and who's in the church, who needs to be saved by the church. But like, we're such like a fun little species of humans, aren't we? I was just like, I love us. I just wanted to like give my, give humanity a noogie when I was on mushrooms the first time. (laughs) I was just like, I love this. I love this, you know? Yeah. And then instead of like that, that Mormon delineation of, yeah, like who deserves love. Yeah. And it's Mormonism so tricky because everything is masked as love. So it's not like they would Mm -hmm. ever be like, these people don't deserve love or these people are less than us or whatever. Everything is just like, we have to save their souls because we care about them, you know? So it's like really hard to see what they're actually saying because everything is painted as how much they care, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, it's all for your good. Yeah. It's like, I, the, I want to help kind of thread some needles love for you to kind of take that journey with me. And so when you um, were, you know, very Mormon and religious, what was your concept of God, Jesus Christ, and like your role underneath them or in in this church? Like, how did you view, because, you know, you can view a very like authoritarian God who's like on your, on your ass all the time mm-hmm. if you mess up, or you could view, you know, this Jesus Christ figure who's mm-hmm. like, kind of like how I viewed it, where it's like, you'll try, you'll get him next time, kid. Christ is here for you. I love you no matter what. What was your conception of God? Mine was kind of like that. Yeah. Like I, and I I think we base a lot of this, well, at least I did. I don't know about other people, but I know I based a lot of this on my relationship with my own dad because that was like my male figure, right? Yeah. And it, it was a good relationship. 
And so when I think about when I thought about God or Jesus, it was that it was that it was like, you, you'll get it. Like, I'm here for you, you know, like a very wise, loving parent, essentially. Yeah. And so for a lot of us in the ex-Mormon space, you know, you go straight from thinking, okay, all right, these truth claims aren't adding up or like, I know God loves gay people or, you know, this is not fitting square peg round hole now. All right. This is not a true thing. And therefore, for other X, Y, and Z reasons, I also don't believe in God. That I cannot substantiate this belief. So where did your path from like how you viewed God, you know, combined with the type of uh, problems that you were having with your anxiety and depression? So kind of how did your perception of God transform and then kind of where is it now? Yeah, I mean, I went through a lot of phases. It was like a lot of anger. Like, how dare you, God? Son of a bitch, you know, you lied to me. That's like, I was in that stage for a long time. Still believing kind of in God, but like. It was weird. Like I, mean, I like, didn't, even though I knew God wasn't like a human, like I thought, I still would get mad at some mythical thing. You yeah. know, I'm like, I just need to be mad at somebody that lied to me about this, you know. Um, and where I'm at now, you know, I have a really, really hard time viewing God as anything external at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like with people who are like very spiritual, but haven't been in any type of religion. Like they practice a lot of prayer still, or they practice a lot of like, they'll talk, they'll talk about it. Like, um, like they'll call it source or, you know, you've heard all these things. And I still have a really, really hard time with that because anything that you pray to, like, I just, I don't feel like this is going to sound awful, but this is the, this is the truth. I don't feel like there's a God who cares if you're comfortable or not. And so people are always like, if they, if you, if you project your human humanness, your human qualities onto a God figure, and then they're not answering your prayers, it's like, okay, either God's an asshole or he doesn't exist. You know what I mean? It was like, I, I still can't, I can't hold that perspective. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. So for me, God for me now is more just like the thing that unites everyone. It's like, it's almost like the, like we're in our little tiny people perception monkey brains. And there's like a, there's like a bigger consciousness that we're kind of blind to that's united and that connects us all and whatever. I view that as God rather than like, okay, let me pray to this thing and ask for help with something because I'm like, I've just had way too many unanswered prayers in that way, if that makes sense mm -hmm. to be like. I just don't think it works like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I have a, I get to ask that quite a bit since I left the church and I've had a hard time like really articulating how I feel because it's it's a journey that I'm on, you know, and then people want to look to me to have some type of answer or whatever. And also on my Instagram, I have a thing called my beliefs where somebody was asking me the other day about like, you know, how do I find my purpose? You know, to, to find your purpose, we kind of have to go backwards and start at the beginning of like, how do you view yourself? How do you view your relationship to other people, the environment that you're in? Like a metaphorical way, it doesn't have to be literal. I think that a lot of times people get too lost in like dogmas and being too literal about things when we're just looking at like tools and like psychology. And so to me, whether things are like actually literal and provable, on one hand, it's like you want things that are completely proven that you can have like go sit down with a doctor and spirituality is a lot more amorphous and, and personal. And so trying to take the best of those tools. So when we're talking about, you know, finding our purpose, what's why do we get out of bed anymore if there's not a God who's going to reward us or anything, kind of turning back everything from, you know, where we want to know why we have a purpose to like knowing what our relationship is with all of our environment. Who am I in relation to this reality? If there's no God to judge me, I guess I just judge myself and just how much, how much confusion and like a tangled web that I hope that we can like talk about that more in this, in this podcast and, and untangle that. Cause that is to me, like the biggest part of the post-Mormon journey is like the, the now what, what's this untangling? Who am I? So and to the, to the answer of God, I, I definitely believe now in a lot more of a a spiritual journey and a type of, of mysticism of things that just pull me that I can't explain kind of where I've come out is I will know my purpose when I can wind things back and I can view myself as part of one, one great whole mm -hmm. that we are all part of and knowing that I'm kind of in this meat suit and I'm going to have 
conditioning and genetics that are going to hold me back from my absolute best potential, but coming into an awareness of that being that the first step and then just working towards feeling at, at one and a unity with, with my kids, with my husband, like seeing myself in them, treating other people, how I would want to be treated because at the end of the day, how I am treating somebody else is not just like a kind favor I do for them. It's like, that's a reflection of what I want as all of us yeah. to, be, to be risen up to. Yeah. And that is that energy tapping into that. That is God to me. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think that just like what you were saying about um, literalism, I think literalism is the downfall of religion. And I also think that a, a vast majority of people, these are just my own, this is gospel according to Stephanie, the mm -hmm. vast majority of people who are struggling with mental health are in a some type of spiritual crisis. I just finished reading um, Man's Search for Meaning. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. Victor Frankel? No, sounds good though. It's like Psychology 101. I think that they make like every psychology student read that. But it's basically, it's a guy that, was, that survived a concentration camp and he, like everybody that he loved, died. And it was essentially, the, the book was just like, if you don't have anything external that's like giving you meaning, what is your meaning? What is your purpose? And I feel like religion, they kind of, they, they place a hierarchy on things that matter and things that don't, right? They're like, okay, this is what equals good, happy, successful well-being. And if you don't have these things, then, then, you know, like, what's the point of, what's the point of life? And so then when you're going through your life and it's like, it's not going how you want. And you're like, okay, I have health issues that are not going away. I am struggling financially. I'm I'm losing people that I love, whatever, so-and-so died, whatever. You're just like, okay, what what is the meaning? What is the purpose? And I'm praying to this God that's like not answering. And so to second what you were saying, I feel like God for me is a state of being where God isn't somebody who, and people will disagree with it, but this, but according to me, I feel like God isn't someone who will grant your wishes if he if he thinks it's necessary or if he chooses to or whatever. It's more like God is a state of being that you can choose to be in and that you can access in yourself or not. So you can be with God internally in the state of being of God, or you can be in hell. You can be in both. It's a state of being. So it's like, you know, if if you're going through something's like severely, severely difficult, and you can still keep your heart open and access love and access that state of being where you can feel that love coming from you. That to me is God, kind of like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No notes. <laughs> can you expand upon that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, so many of these topics are so, um, they take years to kind of, I would say, incorporate, integrate into kind of our being, because it really is like a, a night and day difference from the Mormon mold of how we were taught to be okay with ourselves or show up in what we do in our actions. So with what you just described, how is that different in like your day-to-day -day of how you view yourself, other people versus maybe your Mormon mindset? Yeah. Well, my Mormon mindset was very much like, okay, I'm trying to maintain something and keep my life in a certain way so that I can be happy. I got to make sure all my ducks are in a row because if it falls apart, I will lose my mind. I won't know. You know what I mean? It will be a travesty. Yeah. And expand on that because I was the same way too, where it's like, I know that I'm keeping the word of wisdom and I know that I'm dressing modestly, wearing my garments. Yeah. We were doing a lot of stuff and yeah. it still was coming up so short. Yeah. I mean... For me, it was always, like I said, like a safety thing because I was such an anxious person. So it was like I was doing all these things to make myself feel safe, making sure that I wasn't like I was monitoring what I was thinking mm -hmm. and I was trying to be very loving. That was the biggest thing for me all the time. Like, don't dislike anyone. Be like Jesus. You know, <laughs> if you take a shit on my lawn, I still love you. You know, <laughs> I was just like very much spiritually bypassing all of my emotions because I wanted to be Christ-like so that I could, like, like it, it would come back to me again, right? Like, I could be blessed. Um, and then, of course, like, going to the temple, and I read my scriptures every day, and I said my prayers every day, and I didn't watch rated R movies, and 
I would, I didn't swear. And I would just, it was just like, I was trying to maintain this little tiny utopia in, in my home and in my own life Mm -hmm. where the bad does not exist. Yeah. With like the object being a sense of safety or anything and without, because that's the difference that I wish Mormons, you know, and people get upset at me for making this type of content and be like, you want people to be in a faith crisis and you want people to all. And it's like, all I want is for people, if they are in that state of mind, thinking that they have to hustle for this type of safety that just will not come through this type of religious mechanism. I just know from speaking to you, so many people on Mormon stories, so many experiences myself of just knowing what that hustle is like. And if you're done with that and like, there is a, there's a black and white difference between the ways in which you, you hustle for that safety. And, and then what we're kind of talking about today is like a new concept of God or yourself in a place where you are more in your power and that, you know, anxieties come or human and stuff, but like knowing how to ground yourself and come back to like a home within yourself and a, a house that you build yourself that is not so externally dependent. Yep. Yeah. It's like going from being externally oriented to being internally oriented. Exactly. Yeah. And like creating your own, like I had a therapist one time that told me safety is an internal state of being a cultivated inner state. And I was oh, like, yeah. what? blew my mind i think too you sometimes you have to be in a faith crisis like that's what's so funny to me is that people think that if their life is falling apart that it means that something has gone wrong like that's a very religious perspective if you're going to wake up in this life to your power or to who you are or be on uh, the spiritual path or whatever the first like indicator of that is always some type of betrayal that's like a universal thing so when you when you wake up to this fact that, you know, if you're going through a quote unquote faith crisis and you're waking up to the fact, fact that it's like, OK, maybe these people have been not being so upfront with me or maybe life isn't what I thought. It is going to send you into a faith crisis in order to find what it is that you're looking for, because really what you're looking for is just yourself. Right. Like that's that's so cliche, but that's the honest truth that I believe in my core. And if you're going to actually find that, everything that's in your life that's not you, that you think is you, has to die. It's basically like you're saying, like, this is my this is my story to a T. Like, I'm like, I'm feeling so much anxiety. What do I do? I just want to find inter- internal peace. And then, and then God was, or the universe or whatever, was literally like, okay, this has got to go. That's not you. This has got to go. This has got to go. These are all the things that you think are you, that you think are making you safe, that you think are bringing you happiness that are not. And so in that process, it's going to feel like absolute chaos. It's going to feel like absolute chaos. But that's the beginning of the path. Mm -hmm. That's not like, of course you want people to be in a faith crisis. It's like, yeah, you want them to freaking wake up. (laughs) Yeah, I think. And that's what's so universal about mental health transformation and all of the things that I'm, I'm just really passionate about people kind of being sick of their own bullshit, being sick of other people's bullshit. I come to the table reserving like the the most work for what what can I do to make yeah, my chamber here as safe as possible at all times. Cuz there's just we're going to be sick and tired of looking around and be, being constantly at war with other people how they act, what the church did to us and stuff. And it's like it's this long process of yeah, you know, once once you find out the church isn't true, or like your marriage isn't safe, or like your parents aren't safe, or this job isn't safe, mm-hmm. anytime where there's just this, it's such an opportunity, and that's how I kind of look at this ex Mormon journey. And I don't want to intellectualize my way through it. Is what I've I've struggled with is I don't want to intellectualize my way through like, you know, forgiving this person for doing this or the church for doing that. It's like it comes from a deep like soul perspective now of like, man, we're all people, we're mm-hmm. all messy, and like what a, what a gift though it is to live through this mess. This is my mess I have to live through. And now what do I choose to step into? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, it is a very messy process. And I think, I think most people that leave, if not all deep down inside, they have this desire, like you're saying to move on and to forgive and to be whole and to just be happy and whatever. And because of that, sometimes they will bypass, like you were saying, how they actually feel um, because they just want to be, they just want to be forgiving. I just want to move on. I just want to whatever. 
But the process of getting from where, you know, you just left the church to that can take years and years and years. And it is a messy process. It's like you have to go through what you actually feel in order to authentically get from point A to point B. Yeah. And I hate to always like invalidate other people's experiences or this or that. But what do you think about the concept of people who for so much of the time that I've been on the Internet doing x Mormon content people who are legitimately ex-Mormons who are like, and also leave it alone. I mean, I'm a content creator and I like do this for, but people who, you know, don't make a living at it, or they are still really interested in deconstruction and things like that, where there's, I think there's a lot of ex-religious people where, I mean, I don't want to invalidate them. You guys do you, but very judgmental where I'm like, I don't, I think if you really understood how much there is to deconstruct, They're so about just basic things that you probably grew up in a ward where you were not taught to like, you know, be in tune with your feelings Mm -hmm. and you were not taught a lot of things that are integral to being a happy, healthy human. The, the, that, that type of like ex Mormon where they're essentially, yeah, like leave it alone or like, don't be angry. Right. That's what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is projection. It's like, how could somebody who isn't feeling what you're feeling or going through what you're going through feel like they know what you need because their process is different than yours? Like when I look at people who have left the church and some are angry and some are not, I'm not like, oh, those people shouldn't be angry and those people should or whatever, because everyone's Mm -hmm. process is different. So if you're on the internet telling someone else what they should be doing, that is 100% a projection. The second thing that comes to mind with that is there's still a hierarchy of emotions in there that comes from Mormonism. If you're looking at somebody who is angry and you're saying to them that they need to leave it alone, then you don't understand the role of anger in someone's healing. That to me is somebody who has bypassed their own anger and is telling other people to do the same. And that is something that needs to be deconstructed. Like people who are ex-Mormon are often so weird about the type of ex-Mormon that they are. You know, it's like, oh, well, I don't want to be I don't want to be ruffling any feathers and I don't want to be, I don't want to be angry. I, I don't, I just want to forgive. Yeah, it's you know? like, have you deconstructed your needs for people pleasing? <laughs> yeah. Like, have you deconstructed your, like your, uh, the way you pathologize your emotional states? Cause yeah. it seems like that's what's happening here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I'm like, you guys do. Yeah. I'm trying, I honestly view everything of like, people are on a journey and I can't like judge anybody into taking any path that I've taken. It's just such a wild, wild west it is. of an unstructured place to go. And so it is, it's like, like everything's you, up in the air. All of a sudden it's just like you, you have this formula of what is right and what is wrong. And then you leave and, and it's just like, everything's up for question, you know, mm-hmm. and Mormonism and, and a lot of religions I would imagine shapes your view on literally everything. It shapes your view on gender. It shapes your view on why you're here. It shapes your view on sexuality. It shapes your view on your emotions. It shapes your view on your emotions. Seriously, that's a huge one. Yeah. Because your emotions, like your emotional state leads into, you know, actions you take, Mm -hmm. you know, not always with your best rationale. And then that leads to another thing. And if you're not like centered in why you're doing things and it's the emotions are also coming from like what you think is the spirit, like you have not detangled how to how to move forward with your best values, your intentions, how to settle yourself into that. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that's, and that's, I think something that I see very frequently with people when they leave the church is that they were so used to burying their emotions, disconnecting from their emotional states because emotions either come from God or they come from Satan. They're never just internal. It's like you're being influenced, right? So they're, they're disconnected from the, the, the emotions that they don't want. And then once they leave, it all starts to come up. And it's so overwhelming because we were never taught how to deal with our anger. We were only taught to disassociate from it. And so it's so overwhelming that they're just, it's like you're exploding. You're exploding at people. Like you have all this anger that you're just like, oh my gosh. So it's like a matter of learning how to relate to your emotional states in a way that's healthy and productive, but still incredibly messy. And that's okay. Rather than being like, okay, I I can only be... (laughs) I like, I, I'm going to just continue to pretend that that's not there. You know, Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'll ask it this way. So through the course of your ex-Mormon journey and doing psychedelics, let's say whether after, you know, the trip is over or during it, what are a few of the truths that you've learned? Like where you feel like this is true. I can base a reality and ground myself in this. I believe that 
everybody is one. They say that a lot. People say that a lot. It's like very trendy to say that right now. <laughs> but I really do believe that. I believe that when you attack somebody else, you're really just attacking yourself. And when you hurt other people, you're really just hurting yourself because I think it's like one organism. I think that our natural state is like love, personally. I believe that. Um, but I also don't believe in hell or any type of battle of good and evil. I I definitely had to, like, there were so many months um, where I was going through deep, dark hells of my own. And I just realized that the belief in hell is an illusion. There's actually nothing to be afraid of. And it's just this idea that there is something to be afraid of existentially that we bring into our human life and, and, and project it all over everyone else. This is the basis of violence, of wars. It's at the core. It's like this deep belief that existentially we are not safe. It's like everyone, if everyone knew like, hey, like surprise, there's actually not a battle of good and evil in the next life. You know, there's, you know, this is my belief. Then everybody would just chill out and be like, oh, oh, like maybe mm -hmm. we're actually safe. Like maybe it's actually okay. Maybe we can just relax. What do you think is stopping I mean, if we're all one, I I have that capacity to be, you know, as violent as the person that I I could judge. You know, I just have a different background, different conditioning that holds my consciousness at a different level. So, but what would you say is stopping so many people from being able to kind of believe that and live in that? I feel like it's probably just thousands and thousands and thousands of years of survival of like trying to survive. I think that hopefully everyone will get there eventually, like collectively at some point, but there's so much in the external world that says otherwise, that proves to you otherwise. Like you would never, like if you went to somebody who was in the middle of a war zone and you were like, we're all one and you're actually safe and everything's fine. They'd be like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, there's just so much going on in the world that proves is proving to people that that's not true. They're yeah. like, why would I believe in love? Why would I like, look what's happening here? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard it kind of put the way, like when you're, when your trauma is informing, you know, your emotional state and it's hard to regulate. And obviously your past, you know, violence or discrimination that's been perpetuated against you and just all of that creating, you know, obviously feelings of being unsafe, but I've heard it kind of being put that like people will settle for what they think they should settle for and not being able to, to have indicators around them to, to prove that otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, what's really interesting about deconstructing high demand religion or just leaving any kind of environment that just is not serving to your core. You know, that all of the indicators around you say it's not where you should be. You have a lot to lose, but at the end of the day, there's a lot that can be gained from leaving that, that system and mm -hmm. that's that space and then doing something that can be more risky yeah. and, and feeling like, okay, I've been settling for this. And for me, yes, like psychedelics have, have kind of given me a better map when I'm on my, one of my last, um, actually I don't do mushrooms very often. People think I do them more often than I do, but my last trip that I did, um, all I just kept coming back to, I always create little spaces that are so safe away from other people, whether it's like the top of a mountain inside, like my brain can just create this little lodge of safety. And it kind of helps me ground when I'm off my trip of like going back to that safe meditative space. And my last one, it was like in the forest, so deep in foliage and a, a secret spring of water is what I kind of found after just going through a lot of different, like mentally Thing. It's just like a maze of of forest to find this spring coming down from this waterfall. And it was my secret spring. Nobody else knew where it was. Crystal clear water. And I can drink from it. I can see my reflection in it. And knowing that everybody else has to find their spring to drink from. And like, that's where I get my safety from. And like, without kind of expanding my mind to have that kind of visualization, like the top of the mountain or a spring, a uh, space within yourself that nobody else can really take away. And I wouldn't be able to do that. Maybe I would. Meditation is also great for those things. I have a sister who's got all of the same kind of opinions that I do in a lot of ways, and she's never done psychedelics, but she can, she can relate to those things. But I think, um, yeah, that, that sense of safety with psychedelics is always 
yeah. like highly encouraged on my side, but yeah. And I think you bring up a good point that like, not only is like going back to what we were saying before, like, why, why do people not believe this? Why do they, why do they not feel this love or this oneness or, or whatever? And it's like, not only is it not being reflected in the external world right now, they're not people, most people aren't looking around and just seeing a bunch of love everywhere they look. Right. But we've been so disconnected from our, our own internal safety, like you were saying, that we don't know how to feel it in here either. So it's like, they're not feeling it in here. They're not seeing it out there. So they're like, they're just completely lost. And I feel like that's what psychedelics did for me as well. Um, they kind of, they, it's like they remind your body what it feels like to be in that place. And then you can always go back to that memory and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Because because it's almost like we're trying to get people to be in a state of being that they've never experienced. And they're like, I don't even have a reference point for what it's supposed to feel mm. like to feel that way. And psychedelics help with that for sure. Yeah. Tell me more about like you finding your reference points then. I love hearing about the experience people have of what has helped ground them that they can kind of step into what I call like a remembrance. When yeah. I do mushrooms, it's always like, oh, I remember. Mm -hmm. People say not to look in the mirror, but I always look in the mirror because it's always like, where have you been, girl? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I mean, psychedelics, obviously, it's like every time you do a trip afterwards, you're just like, I'm never coming down. I'm going to be in the state for the rest of my life. And it's not like a high. I want to no. clarify. It's not like a party drug. It's not like a high where you're just like, woo, trip. You know, it's like a, a, a I mean. It's more like sacred. Yeah. That's how I would feel it. Describe it. Like I felt like I was looking for this feeling or the state of being in Mormonism my whole life. And then I did mushrooms and I was like, oh, this is what it is. This is what I've been looking for. It's like a state of, it feels like transcendence right it's like a it, it reminds you of your true natural state of being mm -hmm. um so yeah psychedelics have helped me with that a lot like the weird thing about connecting with that aspect of you connecting with the sacred in you or in the world for me it just comes so sporadically you know like you can have moments where you're just losing your mind and then all of a sudden you're you know child it does something and you're just like in tears and you're like, life is beautiful, you know, um, doing somatic types of therapy. It's just, it's just been all across the board, but it's like, once you have that reference point, it gets a little bit easier to find it again every time. It's yeah. kind of like building that muscle. Yeah. Yeah. And I love when kind of challenges do come up and you lose track of that reference point, because even losing track of the reference point is a reference point of like, how I lose track of it, you know what I mean? Exactly. What, however you find that tool, like come back to a reference point of like how, how your mental health is, is at its best state, how you stay in, um, in spaces where you feel like you're thriving mm -hmm. instead of constantly being, you know, discarded or disrespected or where your autonomy is not respected. And like, we know what that is like within Mormonism. That's the reference point. Like, I know what that is like so often. And I don't like the feeling when I have so much autonomy at my hands, my fingertips here next Mormonism. And then I still am like, up oh, feels like the church again. Yeah. Like we, we have reference points and it's so important to like, for me at least to, to journal and, and remember and, and keep that at the forefront of my mind. Um, so what are, what are some other tools that you feel like people are kind of missing as they, they deconstruct? Like I know, compassion is is always a, a big one that I think comes up as we're trying to learning and yeah. growing but like what are some some things you've had to unlearn or teach yourself the one thing that people often don't want to look at when they leave is how much hurt is there um it it usually goes to like anger which is fine anger is is like a anger is essentially like my my boundaries have been violated like do not do that again this is not okay like without without anger, it's like there wouldn't be activism, right? So it's like anger is good, but there's so much often there's so much hurt that people don't want to see and they don't want to feel from something that they loved and they devoted a big part of their life to being a lie. So I would say you got to feel it to heal it. <laughs> feel it to heal it, but people are afraid to feel it. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. So, okay. Tell me, tell me what your process is like. That is again, so foreign. What we're talking about right. is just, like, just don't have the thought or you judge the thought mm -hmm. or, um, yeah. So encompassed in shame to, yeah. to think that thought, but you're not actually working through 
the reasons that you have it or what you feel like you want to actually do with your life. Cause there's so much judgment around just everything. Yeah. It's, it's almost like your emotional states. You, if you have an emotional state that you don't like, you think that it's because something's wrong and that's not true. That's not how life works. <laughs> emotions cannot be like, we're literally just floating in a field of emotions, right? Like they're just, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they're going to come and they're going to go and they're in you and they're outside of you. And it's like, they're, they're, they can't be pathologized like that. So that would be step number one. Number one, like when your emotions come up, whether it's anger or grief or bitterness or hatred or whatever it is, don't pathologize it. Like, don't sit there and be like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this or I don't want to feel this or whatever. And instead start trying to relate to it. So it can be tricky because, you know, when I first started going through this process and everyone was like, you got to feel it to heal it. And I was like, bitch, I've been feeling my emotions. I've been drowning in my emotions for months and I feel, I don't feel any better. So it's not like you just have to, you, you have to let yourself you know, like spew all over everyone and like, let your emotions just be like bleeding out of you over everyone around you. You have to relate to them. So it's a matter of finding that self, right? Like the big S self and being able to hold space. It's like you're your inner parent. It's, it's reparenting. I was just about to say that. Yeah. 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 Like you're essentially like, okay, I'm right here and this is what I'm feeling. And then you let that part of you speak. You let that part of you express or whatever it needs to its fullest extent. Like there were so many times when I was just yelling F words in the car at the temple or, you know, just like letting it come out in a way that I was holding it so that I could, I could help it heal. Mm -hmm. I love that because the um, amorphous nature, I feel like of emotions are going to take me on a ride, whether I want to be on it or not. Yep. And so if you can find better ways to have that road trip partner, <laughs> yeah. stay buckled in <laughs> and like, I don't judge you for spilling snacks, but let's talk about this. And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to be the one driving. <laughs> yeah. But what I love is I know I have been through such a dark year and what I'm so happy to be in, into this space now through the help of yes, psychedelics, but a lot of like these practices of feeling safe with myself that I can feel these things and it won't get out of control, you know, is this feeling of like, this is going to be a circular cycle that like, I will have highs some days and like some days I'm going to have these lows and I'm going to have to find a way to get through them, but I'm not always going to stay in this pit. And so if I can work with this, it's going to come back up and it's going to be a cycle. It's going to be for the rest of my life. So all I got to do is just like, keep getting better with this road trip partner, keep knowing exactly how I'm going to relate mm -hmm. to these emotions and stuff. And the, the biggest thing I want to, I'd love to hear you speak on this. The biggest thing I feel um, that so many ex Mormons relate to, I want to, I want to read some comments as well that I've gotten um, when I asked people when we were doing this interview to write in and tell me about like where they struggle stepping into their power is feeling regardless of, of my best, my best intentions of what I try to do with yeah, managing emotions is still feeling very, um, kind of lost is one way to put it, but also like psychologically, you are always trying to feel like, am I okay now? Am I okay? Am I a healthy person? Am I, am I moral? Am I doing what's right? How do I judge what I am doing? Is it, I mean, as a content creator, it's like, I have a lot of judgment here. I have a lot of judgment positively, negatively over here. Am I a good wife? Am I like mentally, did I do the tools right? And having a lot of just kind of voices always kind of judging and still cropping up from, I don't know if that's just part of being an ex-Mormon or being a human mm -hmm. being of just like always being like looking over my shoulder of like, am I where I'm supposed to be yet? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you relate to that feeling. Yeah. I feel like I saw this quote one time from, uh, she's an ex-Mormon therapist. I'm trying to think of her. Oh, post-Mormon court. Post Mormon coaching. Do you follow her? Yes, love it, love, yeah. love, love. She's she had this this post one time that was like, rather than asking yourself what should I do or what should I be doing or what am I supposed to be doing, ask yourself how does this make me feel. <laughs> and I was like, wow, like that's mind blowing to me. Like this, we're we're trying to like make sure that we're doing the right thing all the time because that's what we were taught. When really, how you figure out if you're doing the right thing 
is how it makes you feel. That's the answer. It's like, does this thing, doing this thing make me feel shitty? There's your answer. Does this thing make me feel good? Follow that. Mm -hmm. It's like so simple. Yeah. I Here, let me push back on the simplicity of it because <laughs> I think we come from a space in Mormonism where we we know what it feels like to be taken advantage of. We know what it feels like to do immoral things and call it moral or or trick ourselves into thinking that we are on like the right side of God and then knowing being like, whoa, that was not right at all. So I think a part of, um, I don't know if it's like a paranoia or a, like neurosis or something that I was reading a lot of comments that I also relate to is the still like this non-simplistic feeling of like, well, um, uh, I know what it's like when people don't take accountability. So how do I know that I'm doing the right thing and taking accountability? Cause I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but I still feel like I'm, I'm in a space where I could be doing better, but everything around me is telling me I'm doing my best, but I still don't feel like I'm doing my best. Mm -hmm. And like an inner, an inner battle between like so many different signals telling you where, again, you just kind of yeah. feel kind of lost of like, I, I know what it's like to, 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 to feel like lied to. I don't want to lie to anybody. Crap. Did I lie to somebody? Okay. I feel like I don't think I lied to them or is that relatable at all? Yeah, it makes sense. I think it's, it's just like the proof of like the mind fuck because you essentially have people. It's like, I remember I used to say, well, just because something feels good doesn't mean that it's true. This is a little different than what you're saying. But I would feel kind of what you're saying in the sense that it's like, I, you can't trust what you feel is essentially what you're saying, right? Like, yeah, because so much of like what I feel is so informed by like, yeah, uh, you know, my, my attitudes towards having like a healthy ego about myself or my attitudes towards like, um, my, my conditioning to, um, not feel out of sync with like, morality, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. still always being in a space where yeah, you're, you're judging every single thought that, that comes in. The more that you peel away the layers of conditioning, the more you find yourself and the easier it gets to be like, no, I actually do know what I'm doing. No, I actually do trust myself because you just become more and more solid you know, where it doesn't mm -hmm. become, it doesn't feel like you have to question yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's still a process that I'm very much in the middle of as well. For me, like marijuana very much puts me in my ego where I'm like, everything I say is genius. <laughs> is everyone listening to me? Um, and then I can like, you know, watch back something I like record on my phone and be like, TikToks for later. This is genius. And then I'll be like, trash that. <laughs> and then the opposite is true though. Like when I'm on mushrooms, my feeling is like, I do not have one single solitary piece of advice for anyone else out in the world. All the mushrooms tell me to do is just work on my maze. Like I don't need to pathologize anybody, like their journey, whatever else. I'm like, I have enough of a maze. I have a, my own, you know, spring here that I need to be drinking of that is full of water. Stay here. Yeah. <laughs> and like the amount of uh, like judgment and time that we can spend, you know, when we're disconnected and, and trying to put ourselves in like a hierarchy and a judgment yeah. of, of all of that stuff. So for you, what kind of space do, do psychedelics put you in to be able to kind of oh, man. go through, the, go through life? I've only done mushrooms twice. That's it. And then I did mm -hmm. ayahuasca once and then I did, I've done DMT and what's the other one? MDMA, but mm -hmm. it's, that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. So my experiences with psychedelics are always so like this is, this is how I heard it described. If you have a fragile ego or a very rigid ego, me, that's me. When you expand or you go, or you transcend, or you go into something like psychedelics, as much as you expand, because your ego structure is fragile, you will contract that much. So mm -hmm. my experiences on psychedelics are always like good. And I'm like, it's God and it's Jesus, and I love everybody, and whatever. And then afterwards, I'm in absolute hell for a very long time. Do you feel like there's an ego break there, of, yeah. or what? It's like, uh, it's like I come back from that, and all of the parts of me, like my protector parts, are in resistance 
because it's like it's like the ego knows that it's slowly dying and it's like hell no and so i'm just in a state of like constant anxiety or like um paranoia or depression or whatever in between my <laughs> psychedelic trips i'm really selling these <laughs> i know i was about to say I was like, it's because you, it kind of awakens you to start the journey yeah. of how to battle between those things right. with like healthier tools, but at least the, like the journey starts. Exactly. Like. Yeah. It's just a hard journey, <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I mean, I've had all those beautiful experiences that people have on psychedelics. So when you just said like your ego starts to know that there's like a death coming, um, do try to sell that. Sell, sell me on why you would want to have that kind of reality kind TBD. of broken. Just kidding. I don't know yet. I feel like <laughs> to be uh, determined. Yeah. We'll see. It, that's actually not even a joke. It literally is like, <laughs> I know deep down that it's right. Yeah. But do I really want that? <laughs> what if I want people to like me? Yeah. 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 I feel like supposedly what I hear is that when you get to a place where you're more just in your true self energy, that it's way better a way deeper and better type of joy and peace and happiness than anything that you find that anything that your ego thinks you can find elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it feels like just like the ego's like, no, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm holding on to this for dear life. But then, and I have experienced this with certain aspects of my life where I like hold on to something for dear life. And then when it finally dies and crumbles, it's like my heart opens and expands to this new level of like beautiful love that I've never known. You know, I mm -hmm. just haven't, you know, I'm just not enlightened yet, so mm -hmm. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> All right. So I would like to say I love not knowing anything in a way after leaving Mormonism, but I love knowing how to move myself through life and taking little like nuggets of knowledge. And like I said, going through a cycle of like, oh, what I learned from this episode to like coming back and then using that tool and then just feeling really at peace with the cycle, even when it's down and hard. So that's all nice and well and everything. And then, you know, you want to talk to an ex Mormon audience and you like generally know how, how dark some of these things are in navigating and not always knowing, you know, but this specific instance, what, what would you do? What would you do? And it's hard to, to speak um, so broadly sometimes with people knowing how to apply that. So I asked my Instagram audience, what are some of the ways that you struggle with stepping into your power and exercising your autonomy and yeah, growing into your own new self. What are you struggling with and what kind of tools have you used? So I had people write in and I got a lot of really good responses, a lot of heartbreaking responses, as you can imagine. And I wanted to read some and we might all, we might only just be able to just give validation that like, yeah. that's a hard part of life, but I would love to get your thoughts and just go through a couple of these. Okay. All right. So one of my listeners asked, one of the biggest ones is finding power and making choices. I'm four years out of the church. I lean on others for validation to help me make choices when I really need to listen to myself and my inner guide. That's just harder. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest struggle 101. So like I've, I've gone through this as well and still struggle with this, like with trusting myself sometimes. And what has made it easier for me is learning what it feels like to be in your body. And that is a really hard thing to articulate and to describe to people because so many people are disembodied. Like if if you would have told me when I was Mormon or when I had first left that I wasn't embodied, I would have been like, what the hell does that mean? Like how, how can I be in my body but not actually be in my body? So I had to start paying attention to the subtle ways that my body would feel when making certain decisions and it's very hard to distinguish between the mind and and like the body at first because the mind is so loud but you really can at least for me you can get to a place where you can trust how you feel and the mind isn't coming in and saying but what about this and this and this and what about this and this and this you really can drop into here and be like what do i what am i feeling about this and that takes a lot of practice of quieting your mind and a lot of trust in your, it, it, it's like a trial and error sort of like, I don't know, like you have to be willing to connect to or try to start connecting to how you feel in here and quiet whatever's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And the more you do that, the easier it gets. 
Yeah. And speaking of psychedelics, one of the first things that I realized was how much of my life and my thoughts did not feel like they were my own. They were, you know, what judgments I would have from Mormon God or my parents or the other third one was like my sister of always thought checking myself of what I would be doing. How would they feel about all those things? And then trying to make a commitment to myself to like be at home, be at peace with that and try to exercise that as I moved forward. And that in and of itself like we were talking about is, is a journey to constantly find like that center point. And you're going to go on a you're going to have a lot of times where you, you, uh, you move away from that and you do trust somebody else's, you know, but at the end of the day, you have to, you have to know, you have to be your own best advocate mm-hmm. for, for these things because other people are going to have, um, yeah, their, their exercising of what you would hope would be the, the best on your behalf. Mm-hmm. It's not always going to be the best on your behalf. You have to be your own advocate to not be in spaces where you don't feel like your autonomy is respected and quickly realize um, when it's serving somebody else and when it's actually serving yourself. It's like the constant journey that I've gone on because yeah. I, I get something from from trying to to tell other people how to live. Yeah. I'm like, people do that to me. I do that to them. And just we have to find our, our center. So it's, that's why I was always like, don't take this too seriously. Yeah. (laughs) Friends. I have no more friends. My kids don't either. And I'm so damn lonely. Loneliness. Mm. What do you guys say, Steph? Oh, you know, I lost all my friends too. And it's interesting because it's so complicated that like some people will legitimately just get rejected by their friends and family, like outright. My situation was a little more gray where it was like, I don't really know who to point the finger at here. We just changed so much that I was like, I couldn't even, I couldn't relate to any of the people I was close with um, and had to like start trying to make new friends. I don't know if my opinions on this are going to be popular. I don't know if my opinions on this Hit are going to be popular. I'm traditionally a very anxiously attached person. And so I went through a lot of phases of like, like I remember when I first got divorced and I didn't have any friends and I didn't have any prospect even for somebody who I could potentially date. I literally thought I was going to die. I felt like I didn't exist. I was like, what is the point of being here? If there's nobody, like, I don't have anybody, like, why am I here? And I started to get really curious about the belief in more things than just relationship, you know? And I started to get really curious about where can I find meaning in my own life in ways that are not related to the people around me, Totally. And that helped with my loneliness a ton because it was like, oh, I'm taking care of me now. I'm doing things for me. And I didn't feel this like the the hole or the void of the lack of people in my life felt a lot more bearable. I could not relate to that anymore. Uh, honestly, it's so it's it sounds painful. I'm going to I'm going to spend myself dating me It's like Ariana Grande. You know, thank you. Next. Yeah. And then I'm going to quote Ariana Grande right now. It's really <laughs> important to me. <laughs> It's really important that I get that lyric right. <laughs> Everyone leave it in the comments. <laughs> it's in the thank you next song, you know, where it's like, I found somebody and she handles problems and her name is Ari. And I'm so good with that. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it sounds uncomfortable and it sounds painful and stuff, but it's like taking that opportunity to feel lonely is sometimes a real gift that you would not willingly put upon yourself or somebody else. But you're like, how can I reframe this mm-hmm. so that it's a positive and it doesn't come from like, yeah, like cerebrally trying to get yourself to to force yourself to be happy. It's like, I can do so many things that still make me happy, but it sucks when there's, there's kids too. And your kids are, yeah. don't, it's, it's going to be a season as they say. And in, in the evangelical circles, there's just no way around it. Sometimes just got to go through it. So we kind of talked about this. I feel like I can, I feel like I can't just be myself and manage my mental health without pre-screening every thought. So pre-screening every thought, meaning, and I'm curious how this is for you. Like you just, are you second guessing yourself a lot? Is that what it is? Questioning yourself a lot? Yeah. Kind of means judging it like we've been talking about. And like, does this fall in alignment with who I think that I am and who I want to be? And um, whether it's like a very judgmental thought of somebody else or like a very uncompassionate look at myself, because I think in my mind, it's like, I've been talking about, I have such like a commitment to authenticity in this post-Mormon space. Like, I feel like authenticity is the reason that I left. And so to be authentic to the truth, it's like, I want to know all of every thought coming in, who's coming in, 
are we being authentic here? Are you being authentic? Are we all taking accountability? Are we our best selves? That's what I kind of interpret my pre-screening as. So it's, so it's almost like your, it's like a paranoia that's come from your conditioning. Like, it's like when thoughts are coming in, you're like, is this, is this authentic for me? Or is this coming from something? Is this coming from my conditioning? Is yeah. this coming from somewhere else? Is this trying to fill a hole or something? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, or is this authentic? I didn't go through this. Like my anxiety was more in my body rather than my thoughts. You know, a, lo- a lot of people are a lot more mental in that way than I was. Like I was very much like I couldn't get my body to feel safe. It feels like a, um, like a, almost like a seeking for perfection type thing still. Like it's a fear of making the wrong choice still. Like, let's say that you had a, like a, a judgmental thought that came in or something like that. What initially comes to mind for me is there still seems to be, and I'm talking like I'm some sort of like, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know. Like I'm not. There's two girls gabbing. I'm just, yeah. Like I'm just not, guys, I don't know anything. But what comes in for me is like, okay, well, there's still some sort of um, black and white thinking in there where you believe that there's a right thing and a wrong thing, right? Rather than just like, like you're still trying to make sure that you're in the, where you're supposed to be. Is Mm -hmm. that how it feels? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, if I, if I were bringing up, like, if I were doing this in therapy, it would be like working with that part of you. It's like, okay, we need to work with that part of you that is very, very concerned about making sure that you are in alignment because it doesn't have to be that way. And it's, it doesn't work that way. Like that's, go ahead. (laughs) We're not supposed to live in that kind of paranoia, you know? Yeah. I think my favorite thing in overcoming that throughout this past year was a book that I read that I can't remember right now, but I throw it in at the end when I remember the title of it. And it was kind of getting to the core of what your wounds are. And I mentioned this in the first podcast that I did on my channel. Um, It's kind of like I retold my Mormon stories about my life, but I kind of wanted to frame it around like why I was so religious and what that instinct within me that core wound, like what is that still trying to long after? And what what is it still trying to fill? And it's like an abandonment wound. So like I was molested for my childhood. And like, what did that, what did that, that lesson teach me about my worth? And what did uh, my religiosity about how I related to God, what did that fulfill within that? And it usually came back to like an abandonment. So like with the anxiety of, of not being able to stand in your power or questioning your thoughts, because you're, you're so afraid. It's because I'm afraid that if I stand in my power, it's like, well, I'll be abandoned, Mm -hmm. you know, like I won't be as lovable because I have to show up for people in the ways that make myself small to make them big because or else how will I possibly survive? Like all of the messages from like, I don't know, I feel like my entire world as a female, as a, as a content creator, as a, as a parent, as everything, it's like telling you, you have to suffer and be very lonely if you do not make yourself small, like evidence in the past. Yeah. I will add to that as well. I think that often what happens for ex-Mormons or like, like when I hear you talking about this, what it's making, what's coming up for me is we have like an instinctual body and Mormonism disconnects you so much. I know I keep saying this. It disconnects you so much from your body that you essentially have your ego mind that's trying to keep you safe all the time without any of your instinctual body. So there is a different way of knowing, you know, it's like, we're so much like in the neck up. Once you drop into your body and connect with your instinctual body, your mind will quiet more because there's a different way of knowing that doesn't come from here. And you can, you can call it your intuition. You can call it your instincts. You can call it the Holy ghost. Mm -hmm. But there is another way of living and being. And so when I hear that, I hear I'm I'm disconnected from this. And so this is working on triple time to try to make make up for the like it's 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 doing more jobs than it's capable Mm -hmm. of doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Being the only one in my life that believed in my own power and in the low moments worrying that they were all actually right about me and I was clinging to a delusion. Okay, wait, say that again. the, The first part. Being the only one in my life that believed in my own power. Like when you are just in the zone and you're like, 
Yeah. Oh, I see. Thinking some grandiose thoughts and you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to push myself. I'm going to believe in myself where that, that old saying of like, where you, you do it before you're ready, you know, yep. and like people doubting you and this- no one's, no one's, uh, externally validating this. Yeah. You're the only one. Yeah. And then you're like, are they all right? And am I the crazy one? Yep. Okay. And then worrying in the low moments um, that they were right, that they were right. And you're clinging to a delusion. Yes. That I think is a great way to kind of summarize like how, when you are in your low moments or everything we've talked about, like to still come back to some place that you have carved out in your own self that is safe despite all of that. And knowing that like that power is not a delusion. And I want to say too, I almost made a reel about this. I should still make it, but I was going to compile all of the different church talks of the prophets and apostles talking about being deceived. And I was going to say, if you, if you left the church and you feel like you can't trust yourself and you're, it's like exactly what you're saying, where you're like, am I the one that's being deceived? Mm -hmm. Like we, it makes sense to me that people feel this way because we grew up hearing that over and over and over and over. Yeah. I think to, to summarize so much of this with our conditioning from the church and past, you know, traumas or relationships, so much informing us that like you are not as powerful as you think that you are. And my favorite thing that psychedelics have given me was being able to live in a paradoxical way and being so comfortable in a gray area that um, I can describe basically as feeling that that oneness with all of humanity and feeling like a a love for myself that's greater than I've known before and for other people feeling connected to that. But then at the same time, that's where the paradox comes in, knowing how, um, how to have so much self-compassion for myself and others while people do incredibly shitty things, I can do incredibly shitty things and having the compassion for our state to feel like I am part of this, this oneness, this God, this energy that's, that's just gaining a consciousness as we go through these shitty experiences of what we do to others and ourselves, that as that happens, I paradoxically feel like I'm very empowered, but then I'm, I'm empowered enough to have compassion for myself Mm -hmm. when I mess up and that that's not a delusion to feel like to, to, like we've been talking about to be centered in love. Um, another person wrote, Post stepping into my power, I'm struggling with men. I uh, they can't handle it, and I can't handle them. They do shitty stuff, and I can't ignore it. Well, I mean, it depends. It's like there are a lot of people out there, men and women, who are still deeply indoctrinated with the patriarchy, and so there are going to be a lot of people, a lot of men and women who don't, yeah, who can't meet you where you're at, you know, and who are going to continue projecting their conditioning of the patriarchy all over you. Also, what was the second part of the question you said? Uh, And they do shitty stuff and I can't ignore it. Yes. It becomes very dangerous, in my opinion, when you start to um, break off from one entire gender. You know, anytime someone's like men are like this or women are like this or whatever, to me, that feels like a projection. It's it's pointing back to a disconnect in yourself. I sound like a total young in right now, but it's pointing back to a disconnect in yourself of your own inner like of your relationship to the masculine. So that could be at play. But also being said, that being said, there are so many people, like I said, who are still operating underneath that paradigm. There's not much you can do. It's not like you can, it's other than remove yourself, you know? So if it were, if it were me, I would be like, remove myself, but also don't hold this perspective that all men are like this, you know, because that's also not true. So Stephanie, um, where can people follow you? Um, you have some great reels. I told you to come on my podcast because every time you say anything on reels, I'm always like, like share amazing. Perfect. So go check out Stephanie's stuff. So where can people follow you? Yeah. Just on Instagram, Stephanie Ann again. Perfect. All right. I'll put your links down below. Well, Steph, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your your wisdom and your experiences with me today, my audience today. Cannot think of any better way to start off this new in-person studio setup than to have you share all these experiences with me. So I'm super grateful. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Thank you guys for tuning in to the end. And if you like this type of content and want me to bring on 
more friends of mine and more people who are just talking about the road that is difficult that we try to pave for ourselves as, you know, ex-Mormons, ex-religious people, please let me know. I know from working at Mormon Stories and, and other episodes that I've made like this, these types of conversations are so important to me. So I just always want to give people the best tools that I can, of what's helped me, what I can speak from my experience, bring on really intelligent guests like you to kind of share with the audience of how we make it through life post-deconstruction. So if you appreciate this type of content and this video, please let me know in the comments. Please share any of the other tools that you found in helping yourself step into your own power. Thank you to everybody who's donated. Huge shout out to everybody on Patreon, my donors to my last fundraiser. Um, I would not be able to, to buy this equipment and get my setup going and have everything in place that I need to book these new interesting guests I'm going to have on without the donors. So huge, huge thank you to everybody who supports this channel. You guys have helped me start this nonprofit, help make it sustainable, help community build within the sex Mormon space. And I'm so lucky that I get to do this and have these types of conversations. So anything you can do to continue the support, all the links will be down below of where to donate. I have lots of different types of diverse content, all kinds of stuff coming out throughout the next few months and some other exciting announcements. To look forward to. So thank you guys for subscribing to this channel as I know you already have hitting the like button and see you next time. Love you so much. Bye. But if there's something else you want to say, yeah. I think I can't feel. I've had the sock of <laughs> I've had the sock of there you go. no discernment. I'm switching the thing with my toe because my husband left. I'll put this at the end so people know how hardcore I am. It works right. I need to have braille for the feet.